All right. So we're we're uh, we're doing exactly what we did with particle dynamics, where we went from what we went from kinematics then to kinetics when we looked at particles. And if you remember, when we got to the kinetics, we had three flavors of methods to solve kinetics problems. Remember what they were? Oh, come on, Jake. Yeah, you do. Yeah, yeah. F equals MA. The other two come right from that, so it's not like they're exclusive. But as I think we've seen, they did... Uh, kind of lay themselves out for different types of problems. Bob just said the work energy method and then impulse momentum. impulse momentum. That's even what we did in uh, in physics one. So it was kind of a review, but we did a lot more in depth, especially since we, we took non um, constant acceleration problems. And then we started with rigid body motion, rigid body dynamics. We just finished the kinematics of that. And now we're going to go to the kinetics, just like we did with the particles. Now we're going to see what it takes to actually get the accelerations and velocities that we had in the rigid body motion. Uh, but don't forget that we're also not doing just rotation. We're also, we also still have the possibility of uh, exclusively translation or the combination of translation and rotation. So our kinematics involve all, all of those things. But the kinetics, uh, a little bit more involved we still will have this equation, but we're now also going to have to do something about the fact that forces can cause things to rotate. When we looked at our particle motion, there was no difference to us between a problem like that and a problem like that. When we looked at particle problems, there was no difference in those two situations. Yet, you know that most certainly there is. That we can replace this second possibility with something that looks a little bit more like the first. But the fact that we've displaced this force by some distance now we have to also put in a moment or uh, Alex since you uh, jumped over statics you didn't hear the term moment really um, we, we take it as torque in, in physics one so very same thing but uh, uh, as you remember we can th these two systems for our uh, needs are equivalent systems um, Particle motion does not take into account the fact that these first two are even different. So now we do. So we're going to have to uh, come up with something where we also look at a sum of the moments business. We'll set that up in a, in a second. And then we are going to have, again, the work energy and the impulse momentum methods that will work for rigid bodies as well. All right, so that's uh, that's where we're going here in the next uh, in the next couple of days. Well, we only have three weeks left, and one of the days is a test, and I think one of the days is review, just so the test wouldn't be on the last day. Give you kind of a break from that. Professor's doing that. All right, so let's... Uh, 
let's see if we can uh, improve our kinetics so that they reflect, uh, reflect the kind of thing we need. All right, uh, first and foremost, whatever the object is, uh, there is some center of mass to it, some center of gravity. If it's a uniformly dense solid and a uniformly thick solid, then that center of mass is also at the area centroid, which uh, is a simple fact we've used several times before. Now we've got this possibility that there are forces or a force acting. Maybe that's the, uh, well, we'll go ahead and call it the sum of the forces. And then that can cause some kind of acceleration. And I'll put a little G on there to remind us that, uh, that uh, well, in particle motion, we didn't need that because that's all that would happen. There'd be some unbalanced force on some mass and it would accelerate. Now, uh, there's a little bit more going on, as you'll see in a second. So we're going we're gonna to have this subscript of G. But we know that, that uh, the forces as unbalanced will cause that center of gravity to accelerate somewhere. We have to add to it the possibility that there's going to be some kind of rotation or at least some kind of moment due to that force. So we have to take that into account too. So we have, uh, uh, if we sum the moments about G, if you remember, we set this up a little bit ago and uh, that was the uh, time rate of change of the angular momentum. These two equations were actually very similar because this one was uh, time rate of change of the linear momentum and this one was the time rate of change of the angular momentum. That look a little bit familiar from uh, a couple weeks ago, I think. I hope. All right. Trouble is, I don't know about you. My trouble is that I find the first one quite easy to work with. One, we're just more familiar with it. And two, uh, when we have forces on something and cause it to accelerate, it's kind of it's kind of right there. You can see what it's going to do. You can see what it takes to do something. You look at this equation, okay, I, I can understand what moments are, I can visualize them. I can't visualize that. That's not something that my mind can work with simply. So we can do a little bit more with that and get this to be somewhat more useful to us. Go something like this. Uh, a little bit of it has to do with what we did before. Remember this angular momentum, not the time rate of change of the angular momentum, just the angular momentum itself was the fact that uh, we are some dif distance from a reference point, which uh, we can take for now to be this point G, because, uh, I already erased it, but uh, that was, was sort of our uh, a good reference point with our original situation, where we had uh, a force that was not acting through G, and that's the type of thing we're trying to investigate now. And then that was crossed with the uh, linear momentum, that of the center of mass, which we kind of need to pay attention to now because the center of mass may have some velocity that other points on the body do not have because it may be rotating. It can be doing all kinds of things. If it was just simple translation, every point on the body would have the same velocity and I wouldn't need this. Now that we've got rigid body motion, uh, we need to pay attention to the fact that the center of mass is going to be going some velocity and, well, for the time being, God knows what the other points could be doing. 
so we're going to have to uh, have to pay attention to them, and get to get ready for them in a in a little bit. All right, so we have that little bit. That's that's I don't know a little bit more workable than this is, but let's see let's see where we can go with this to make it even more useful to us in a second. Um, if we're talking about multiple parts to the body, we can, uh, or multiple components of some kind, we can sum all this business up over all of those pieces, and that will then represent the whole body, uh, all the body pieces. So we can sum over all these little pieces doing this. Every little piece might have its own velocity. Doesn't seem like that's an easier step for us, but it will be in a little bit. Because when we sum up what all the little pieces are doing, of course that's got to be what the body as a whole is going to do, so uh, we should be okay with it. Uh, we're looking at uh, 2D motion, so we can simplify that cross product. Those vectors will be uh, uh, mutually exclusive in uh, some part, and we'll take, uh, we'll take our usual direction as positive. So this can become then the sum of R, M, V, K. Which now puts it into our 2D. It's not that it doesn't work in 3D, it's just things are going to get easier for us if we, if we do this. Uh, so now we've got the magnitude and the, and the direction of everything. Oh, skipped a skipped a little piece. That's that's in fact. Ah. Okay, good thing you take notes in chalk. So we've got this R cross M R I. Okay. Now that V we just had as omega cross R I. That's the part we need. Now we can go to the 2D step. Sorry about that. Now we go to the 2D step. And now we get uh, the sum of M I R I squared omega K. There we go. That's the part we need. Now we're all right. However, remember for a rigid body, omega is constant for the entire piece, so that can come out of the summation. So, redirect you with the magic arrow of algebraic redirection. And we get uh, omega comes out of the summation. We get all of the rest left over, which is just a characteristic of the object itself. None of the dynamics is now in there. That's just whatever the object, that, that all has to do with object geometry. Um, in fact, if we wanted to make dm small enough, uh, these, these mass pieces small enough, this would then become just the integral of r squared dm. Either way, it's the same thing. And either way, I hope that this integral r squared dm or the summation of m r squared for all the pieces looks maybe a little bit familiar. Nope. Anybody does it? No, nope, not quite. You'll recognize it. It's the mass moment of inertia. 
which you remember is a purely geometric property. So this whole thing becomes I omega. And if you think back to physics one, where we had a, a rotational analog for every linear component uh, variable we had, we also had a rotational equivalent for mass, and that was the mass moment of inertia. Now, the reason this becomes so very useful to us is all the way back here. Because now this time rate of change of the angular momentum, which we've now determined is Oh, we'll have to put a G on this I, because as we know, uh, uh, moment of inertia is different about different axes. We now have that, that's the time rate of change of that, uh, that vector. Well, it sort of lost its vector quality. I guess we need the K in there. For our 2D, 2D analysis. Now, remember the moment of inertia is a characteristic of the solid itself no matter what it's doing. Omega is what it's doing. So IG comes out of the integration we get d omega dt, which is alpha. And now we have our two equations governing rigid body motion. And I find ig alpha a lot easier to work with than h dot was. I don't know about you. I do. For our two-dimensional problems, oh, I guess I needed the vector sign in here, sorry. Um, for our two-dimensional problems, this is three equations, because the sum of the forces is in xy, then the sum of the moments is in k, so we have three equations. We can handle problems with three unknowns. Four two-dimensional problems. If we had three-dimensional problems, this would be a full six equations in all three dimensions. However, don't forget, though, that we also have any kinematic question, equations we used before. So we can solve problems of greater than three unknowns because we also can pull in, in fact will, pull in the kinematics equations. Before you raise that, um, <laughs> yeah, that's right. I don't understand this this term here. This m sub i goes to zero and this m goes to r sub no, i. No, it, yeah, as, as if uh, for this, if we're talking about a solid of discrete masses, so there's M1, there's M2, there's R2, there's R1, you know, like a, like a satellite type thing might be, then this equation applies nicely. If we're talking about a continuous solid, then we break it into little elemental pieces. So this is dm, and it's located someplace r. I don't know, what do I put? Uh, dm. And then we have to do that for the entire solid all over the place. And for it to be accurate, dm has to go to very, very small pieces so that we do the, the continuous uh, integral over the entire object. So we have these two 
kinetics equations in two dimensions So obviously for problems now, that moment of inertia is going to become important. So let me just uh, uh, do a little bit of review for us on that. It's the integral over the entire solid uh, r squared dm for a continuous solid rather than for a solid made up of discrete parts. We could even handle, if we need to, the possibility that uh, the density changes with position. So we could do the same, same uh, integral that way. However, as you can imagine, uh, these exist, these integrals exist for regular solids so that we don't need to do the integration. That's not the point of this class. That's in Appendix D4 in your book. Way, way at the back, you have uh, lots of regular solids, cylinders, hollow cylinders, parallel pipe beds, all kinds of stuff. Uh, the usual ones, spheres, hollow spheres, conical sections, all kinds of things. And in there are the uh, moment of inertia through the centroid, but also through other parts of the object. Remember that the moment of inertia through an axis through the center of gravity will be different than the moment of inertia about some other axis parallel to it and separated by a distance d. If you remember, that's the parallel axis theorem. And uh, so uh, if we have the moment of inertia about an axis through the centroid, through the center of mass, we can find the moment of inertia about an axis parallel to that. That's the parallel axis theorem. Mm -hmm. From this business, we also define then a term uh, may or may not sound familiar. I don't think we used it in in uh, physics one, uh, radius of gyration. Have you heard that term before? Radius of gyration is some distance we call K that if all of the mass was collected at that distance in an infinitesimally thin ring, but all the mass was there, that would have the same moment of inertia as whatever we're talking about in the problem. And they're related by uh, that, that, uh, that equation. Uh, there's not any great use to this other than the fact that a lot of times in, in some of these problems or in, uh, in other problems in industry, I guess, you're more likely to hear the radius of gyration rather than the moment of inertia. And it's the moment of inertia that we need for this equation. It's also true that we can get the moment of inertia about another axis and the radius of gyration about another axis but the equation still is the same. So if we have some object and we took all of its mass and collected it at some 
radius such that those two objects had the exact same moment of inertia, that radius would be the radius of gyration. An abstract uh, concept, but uh, one that is of uh, common use in these problems. All right. Obviously, moment of inertia is going to be important in these problems. There are five ways you'll come up with a moment of inertia in a problem. It might just be given in a problem. This is common for more complex solids like uh, satellites and, and uh, bicycles and other things that we might need to look at it. Uh, it's just given. It's also possible for you to look it up. Check in that appendix D4. If the solid we're using is in that table, just use the moment of inertia from the table. Not often are our problems just simply um, objects out of the table, but it might be composites of objects given in the table. So you can sum up all the moments of inertia of them individually, applying the parallel axis theorem if it's necessary. Could also be that you're given the radius gyration instead and then just simply calculate the moment of inertia from that. The fourth possibility and a student favorite integrate it and figure out what it is. Figure it out yourself. That could be, though, uh, uh, if you add up the uh, moments of inertia of regular solids, then you're okay. The fifth possibility, one that sometimes sneaks up on students, is that you just simply don't need it in a problem. If you remember back to Physics 1 or even some of the problems we did in this class, there were occasionally times when you thought the mass was important and it turned out it wasn't because it canceled in the problem uh, from the equations and then wasn't even necessary. Free fall problems were always that way. Remember, the mass didn't apply. But if you did free fall problems as a work energy problem, the mass is in there and it doesn't cancel out to the end and then you remember, oh yeah, free fall problems, we didn't need it. All right, and then just a reminder, the last little piece for composite bodies. Bodies made up of some of those regular solids that are in that table from method two. You can sum up all of the pieces uh, applying the parallel axis theorem if necessary. All right, sounds like a horrible mess, but it's not, so um, we'll do it. Which one of these? We'll do the, we'll do this a little bit simpler one here. What? <laughs> Just tell me that I don't have to go back and rewind the tape. You know what? I'm going to have to mic you for this class.
Okay. Imagine a 747. Oh man, that looks like that's what they look like right there. Man, oh man, that's a pretty darn that's like a photograph. What? Now you're huh? Where's the swings? Where's the swings? They're there. Can't draw them because they're swept back, see? Um, it's got this this uh, big landing gear type thing, if you remember, plus some little nose thing there. Yep, that's what they look like. Exactly what they look like. All right. Uh, Want to find out the uh, reactions the forces on the wheels. Now, as a statics problem, not a big deal. Uh, center of gravity, right about there, it will put it. Let's say that it's five meters in front of the back landing gear and 22 meters. behind the front landing gear and five meters off the deck. So see when we did particle motion, none of that mattered. We didn't care where this is because whatever the forces were, we just did what they were. Um, so we can figure out then from a statics problem what these reactions are. And we'll call them A and B. And we can do that pretty quick. Uh, we can do it, uh, oh, I think we need to give it a mass to 250 megagrams got to be one of my favorite units. 250 megagrams. So we can figure out very quickly, uh, I hope, what those, uh, what those reactions were. For example, we can sum the moments about one of the points, um, one of the forces we Pick one of them, then we don't have to worry about it. And uh, Alex, we did this in physics one, uh, some of these simple type problems. So, uh, W, the weight, times five meters, must equal or B times 27 meters. Is that right? So just practice, quick practice, quick warm up, because that's just a statics problem. It's just sitting there on the uh, sitting there on the tarmac, waiting to taxi out. So uh, that's not good enough for us. That's just a statics problem. But uh, I'd like to compare it to what happens to uh, these type of problems during takeoff. And then we sum the forces.
the weight's going to be at the back. That's why they have those multiple wheels there. The front, well, you've often seen guys just walk out and they lift up the front and move the plane around. You seen that? You haven't seen them do that? You have A and B? Well, go ahead and give them to me. Uh, a is, uh... Come on, Pat, wait. Hold on. There was something down there. B is 45,416.7. Gee, how about a few more significant figures in there, please? Yeah. 454, right? Killing him. And B, or A was. Somebody's got it. Colin, got it? Alex? Beth? Two thousand kilonewtons. That's what you meant. Alright, that's just a statics problem. That's that's no good to us here. Because during takeoff, now Doobie will draw on the wings. The wings are maybe something like here with the engines below them. So that generates thrust that is a little bit below the center of gravity by about two meters. How does that change then the reactions at the wheels? That now becomes a statics problem. Because that's going to generate some moments that weren't there before. Also cause some acceleration of the plane itself. That's the point of turning on the engines. So now let's figure out what the um, now let's figure out what the uh, what the reactions of the wheels are. All right, uh, I like to go from to the dot notation just because we do have a subscript here. If we are doing things in the x direction, uh, then we have another layer of subscripts, which I'm not real fond of. So if we use the dot notation, we only have the one subscript, G. Forces in the x direction, obviously the thrust. There's a little bit of rolling friction at the wheels, but not much, certainly not much compared to the thrust. So that's our x-direction equation. Oh, by the way, we do have the thrust. It's uh, 700 kilonewtons. So we can figure out the acceleration of the center of gravity, the acceleration of the plane itself down the, down the tarmac. And that problem is no different than what we would have done in particle motion. 
no different than what we would have done in uh, Physics 1. So we'll take it a step farther. We still haven't found the reactions. All that did is give us the acceleration. So we're going to have to sum the forces in the y direction as well. Well, we've already done that. That's a plus b equals w because there is no acceleration in the y direction. Now we can sum the moments. Remember about some point that's convenient. It might be convenient to uh, do some other points. However, don't because the only equation we have so far is the moments summed about g. Oops, I didn't even put the g in there. We only have an equation for summing the moments about g. As you're going to see in a minute, things change when we sum the moments about other points. All right, going to sum the moments about g. What's the moment of inertia of a fully loaded 747? With respect to an axis through its center of gravity. Well, go down that list of five ways to find it. Don't need it. It's not given. It's not in that table. Uh, don't have the radius of gyration. Probably don't want to integrate it, especially since we don't have any other dimensions than just these, and we certainly don't have the weight distribution. So the possibility is that we don't need it. Why don't we need it, though? It's right there. plane is taking off, still going down the runway. Well, we don't even know if it's takeoff. It's just a thrust of 700 kilometers. Could be taxiing. But it is just running down the runway. What's alpha? Zero. Zero. It's not rotating. It's only translating. So we can sum the moments about g, and we get uh, essentially this same equation except we have the thrust in here where we didn't have any thrust there so um, we'll take uh, all the since they all sum to zero we'll take the counterclockwise thrust I mean uh, moments so that's T times 2 meters. A makes a clockwise moment about G. B also does a counterclockwise moment about G, so we'll add it over here. Uh, what is that? 22 meters B. Those are the two counterclockwise moments, and that must equal, since they all sum to zero on this problem, um, the clockwise moments, which is A. So we have two equations, A plus B equals W, and uh, two unknowns.
Got it, Ruby? Yeah, for a statics problem when there wasn't any thrust. This equation here, the moment equation, is a different equation than we had here. The statics. This is now a dynamics sum of the moments. Spirit. I'm not playing. Uh, we're 
<laughs> working on it right now. I have two. Oh. Five O. Oh. So, Colin, you were within round off. Maybe you used nine point eight one instead of nine point eight or something. That's what I had. Jake, you're not going to contribute yet, so that made this one four oh two. I got eighteen hundred. Never mind. B. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, 600. Well, now look at the problem. Does it make sense that B would go down and A would go up? The thrust is pushing under the center of gravity. The center of gravity is the point about which it would tend to rotate if it could. It can't, of course, because it's in contact with the pavement. So this thrust pushing under the center of gravity would try to turn the plane that way, which would increase A and decrease B, which is what several of us got, but not everybody. What? By A. By A. To, to exactly this. 1800. <laughs> Did not. 1800 is less than 2000. All right. Well, the only place to go wrong is algebra. Yeah. Isn't it? I got that. If what? If I use 9.8 instead of 9.81, I got that. 9.1? Where'd that come from? 9.81. Oh. I thought you had 2300. No. 2061. Oh, 2061. Somebody else had 2300. All right, anyway. Something something close to this. All right. Uh, we got to take care of other possibilities, though. Turns out that this moment equation with the moment summed about the center of gravity isn't always the easiest thing to use. We have some situations where we might have some, some lovely object of some kind with some center of gravity somewhere and a couple forces acting on it. Well, maybe there's a force there and a force there and a force there. Could be that uh, we don't know what all those different little pieces are and the like, or we don't know exactly how they act or something. But it might be easier for us, instead of summing the moments about G, which gives us three components to that, oftentimes we've seen, as we have before, that there's some other point. It might be more uh, efficient or prudent for us to sum the moments about. It might be a little easier for us to sum the moments about point P. Most of our problems won't be this oddly complex, uh, you know, that a lot of the very regular programs point or problems. Point P could be quite easy to find in, in a lot of type of problems we look at. But the some of the moments about point P could indeed cause it to rotate. However, it'll be a center, uh, a moment of inertia with respect to that point P itself. Same type of equation, however, it's about a different p, uh, a different point. Either equation is perfectly fine. Uh, always make sure that the subscripts match. The trouble is, we might not know what I, P, 
is the moment of inertia with an axis uh, with respect to an axis through P. Remember, these are two-dimensional problems, so the axis is in the z direction, the k direction. We do know often what the moment of inertia through the center of gravity is. However, when we apply the parallel axis theorem, knowing that this will, these forces will cause some kind of acceleration, we can adjust things by uh, using this form of the sum of the moments equations. This just comes from the parallel axis theorem, and you can derive this in about three seconds using the deal that uh, A equals R alpha, actually in this case it'd be D instead of R, our book happens to use D, where D is the perpendicular distance from the point to the direction of acceleration, whatever that might be. Wait, so is D the same as R? Yes. This is the form, you're more familiar with it. Uh, D is what our book happens to use for, for the uh, parallel axis theorem. So we need another bracket. To there you go. It gives us an alternative way to sum the moments. We have several possibilities now when we're summing the moments, depending on what's easiest for a problem. This first one still applies. It's not that it doesn't apply for other problems. It just not might not be the easiest one to use. This second one also applies, but again, may not be the easiest one to use. The third one may apply, but may not be the easiest one to use. Use whichever one of them is the easiest. So let's look at one type of problem and see how this applies there. temporary problem that applies right up to the very moment of our lives. If only I can ever get this projector to work. I don't get it. How come I turn it on and it immediately goes back off? Wait, one of you has a little projector clicker you stole from Bobby. You got a smartphone that has a projector app on it. There we go. All right, see, it's spring. Let's do a lot more problem. All right, what? Draw it, that's a photograph, man. It's a picture of my lawnmower and my grass. Wait. Yeah. All right, some of the, let's see some of the details. We can see center of gravity is 215 millimeters off the deck. There's a wheelbase with respect to center of gravity. And, uh, well, we're going to do this problem where it's a self-propelled mower. So take P as zero. So we want to find that, uh, we want to find the forward acceleration for the self-propelled mower, rear-wheel drive, 
without the operator actually having to do any pushing. Uh, two little things you'll need that aren't up there. Let me make sure I get the right one. Is the uh, coefficients of friction, mu s and mu k. We want to we want to determine what the what the uh, acceleration is, and of course this acceleration is going to be parallel to the ground and forward, kind of like the plane just was. All right. So uh, well, the place the acceleration lives is in the x direction equation. Remember, there's a P in the drawing, but P is zero for this problem. Let's see what will be the forward acceleration if the wheels are engaged, but the uh, uh, but the operators just uh, let go of it. His phone ring or something. Maybe he noticed that his, his daughter was playing out in front of the mower. So instead of turning off the mower, he ran around to the front to get her. <laughs> so he what? So he felt long more yeah, it's <laughs> much more exciting that way. All right. Are there any forward forces here? There must be, or there wouldn't be any forward acceleration. We're trying to determine what a sub g is, or x double dot g, same thing. What forward forces are there? Remembering that p, even though it's in the picture, is zero. What? Doing what? Well, we can't sum the force if we don't have a decent free body diagram, so let's finish that then. Any forces? Who wants to jump in with the easy one so they get the rest of the afternoon off? Good, Alex, the weight. Acting at the center of gravity. We didn't necessarily care where it acted before other than it acted down. Now we have to play, pay attention to the fact that there's a bunch of different positions in all of these problems. And the center of gravity is most clearly one of them. It's even specifically listed as such. What other forces? A normal force at each wheel. Uh, B and C. Label. What else? We still have no forward force, so there's not going to be any forward acceleration. Friction. As the back wheels, it's a rear wheel drive, tend to turn, they produce friction in contact with the ground. Rear front wheels will just take to be uh, uh, simple rolling wheels with minimal resistance. What else? We don't have all the forces. No sense doing the problem. We're doing the wrong problem. It's like an angular acceleration. Back wheels are angular velocity. No, I want forces. This is a free body diagram. So uh, notice I, I, did, I did put the kinematics result of the forces in a different color. What other forces? That's it. That's all there are. So we know that the friction times the normal force, well, wait, times uh, that normal force, B, so is going to cause it to accelerate. We're looking for that acceleration. Sorry? 
because of oh 50 kilograms by the way it doesn't matter but if the friction going quite in the wrong way because it's not look like it's going to speed speed it up it is you turn on the gas the wheels start to turn and it accelerates forward so the friction has got to be forward Remember, oh, okay, never mind. Yeah, I get it. it's the friction, the wheels are pushing back on the grass, the grass is pushing forward on the wheels. So that's our x direction equation. We, uh, well, which kinetic, which, which coefficient of friction for greatest acceleration? Well, the greater this is, the greater that's going to be. So the static friction, uh, as you should know anyway, you'll get better acceleration if the wheels aren't slipping. You want them to remain in contact. So the maximum acceleration will come at the maximum friction. Uh, well, we don't know B. The only way to find that is with the sum of the moments in the y direction. Of course, uh, we don't want to accelerate. Now, remember, in these type of vehicle type problems, there's always the possibility, maybe desirous, of a wheelie. In that case, the center of gravity would have a y direction acceleration, even though the object was still in contact with the ground. Those are things we never had to consider before. So, uh, plus c equals w so we're uh, we're a little bit stuck in that we don't have um, we've got two equations three unknowns so we still got to keep going so we need to sum the moments about what point We can do it about G if we knew the moment of inertia about G. Well, we wouldn't need the moment of inertia about G, would we? Because there's no angular acceleration. However, that will load this equation with all of these three unknowns and things are still algebraically complicated. If we sum the moments about, say, B, two of the forces drop out of the problem. However, we will have this piece to it. Of that uh, business that comes from the parallel axis. So notice that the sum of the moments about G might be zero, but not about B. However, this is pretty easy stuff in that it's all directly part of the problem. We'll take the uh, counterclockwise direction to be the positive direction that fits with our x and the y. So let's see, the uh, c times the wheelbase, distance between b and c, is a positive moment. What's the wheelbase? 700 millimeters. You agree that that's a positive moment? What else? Summing the moments about B, which eliminates two of the forces from the problem, make it a little bit easier. You have weight clockwise direction. So that's a negative. We know what the weight, well, we know what the mass is, so we don't consider the weight an unknown. Its moment arm is 200 millimeters. What else? It's 
that it for the forces? Yep. All right. Now, here's one place we do have to be very careful. This acceleration is uh, in a clockwise direction with respect to B. So we have to put it in as a negative sign. That is a tricky part about, about uh, using this method. So the mass is 50 kilograms. X double dot we're looking for. What is D? D is the minimum distance between B, our point of uh, summing the moments, and the acceleration vector. Acceleration vector is a uh, minimum distance of the 215. So watch out for that minus sign. That's an easy one to uh, Easy one to skip. All right, so we've got all the pieces then. It's a little bit easier. We'll probably have a debate whether that's actually easier than having some of the moments about G, but it's a pretty easy, easy demonstration of it. How's the acceleration compared to the 747? Is it comparable? At least we had to have a race between the two. That'd be kind of exciting. Well, 
this equation, there's only millimeters, but they cancel because there's millimeters in every term. So it doesn't matter what the units are in this term, in this equation, as long as they're all the same units. The millimeters appears in every equation. And these ones didn't appear. Yeah, it doesn't in W, but now that they've canceled out of the other terms, it doesn't matter. You put in W, that will just give you the units there. So if you use meters per second squared here, you'll get meters per second squared there. Yeah, 11.03 meters per second squared per inch. No. No, what I got. Are you just trying to find x double dot? X double dot. To find b and yep. c. You may have to find a and b, or uh, sorry, b and c on the way. And then notice if P did exist, that force exerted by the user, all of this changes. The acceleration? No. That? When going to lottery? The acceleration lottery? Uh, or, uh, Colin? Uh, 4.03. Colin, man, you're just, you're, 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 you're cruising here today. You get out of mowing the lawn. I have 4.14 meters per second squared. All right, check those. Did you use uh, 9.8? Yeah. Yeah, I use 9.81, so that might be that. B is 414 newtons, and C I got was 77. So what was the